Well, God is the God of second chance, fresh starts, and new beginnings. Amen? Amen. And if you could use a fresh start, then welcome to the study of the life and book of Joshua. God gave Joshua and the Hebrew people a second chance, a second shot at the promised land. Consequently, they enjoyed their glory days. And if you're ready to enjoy yours, then this study is for you. We're going to begin by making our glory days declaration. The words are going to appear on the screen. We do have our sincerity meter floating around. So if you say it like you don't mean it, you're in trouble. Just kidding. Let's all fill our lungs with air and our hearts with hope. Let's say it like we mean it. These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true. His word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. You have blown wind into our sails. You have been the lifter of our heads. You have been to us the perfect Father. Thank you. Now, Lord, as we look into this message and into another week, we ask that you please instill within us strength to have the right perspective of life, the right view of the future, and the right view of the past. We pray especially today that you would break the chains of guilt that have held us back for so long. Help us to march into this week with renewed freedom found only and in, in you. Through Christ we pray, and all the church said, I've got a memory from the 1991 Super Bowl. Now, I'm not a football junkie, nor do I have a great memory. In fact, I don't remember anything else from the 1991 football season. But I do remember something out of that Super Bowl game that prompted a headline. And that newspaper headline was prompted by Scott Norwood's kick. He played for the Buffalo Bills. The city of Buffalo had not won a major sports championship since 1965. But on that night of the Super Bowl in Tampa Bay in 1991, it appeared that the ball was finally going to bounce their way. They were back and forth all evening with the New York Giants. They were one point down with only seconds to play in the game. And they marched the ball down the field until they reached the 35-yard line of the New York Giants with enough time for one more play. And so they called Scott Norwood, their all-pro kicker. One year he had gone 32 for 38. He had made kicks from this field goal, dist uh, di kicks from this distance over a hundred times in his career. He was as predictable as snow in Buffalo. <laughs> they just needed him to kick one more field goal. So he trotted out onto the field. He went through his pre-kick routine. He tuned out the crowd. He set the target line. He got a feel for the timing. He waited for the snap, and then he kicked the ball. It flew through the Florida sky for exactly 1.3 seconds. Norwood kept his head down, and he followed through. And by the time he looked up, the ball was already three quarters of the way to the goal. And that's when he realized he missed the ball sailed to the right. The wrong sideline erupted. The city of Buffalo groaned. Scott Norwood hung his head. And the next day, the headline that I still remember read, Wide to the right forever. No mulligan. No second chance. No reprieve. No do-over. Scott Norwood could not rewind the tape and try it again. The ball was wide to the right forever. And he would have to live with the consequences. 
just like Joshua. Joshua's army suffered only one defeat during their seven-year campaign to retake the Promised Land. But that one defeat was severe. The village of Ai, A-I, I-Y-Y, Ai, pounced on Joshua. They were smaller in number, but they were greater in resolve. And they pounced and ambushed Joshua's men and sent them running back into camp. Joshua later learned that there was a man in the camp who had disobeyed God's command, a man by the name of Achan. And God lifted his favor from the Hebrew people until that particular rebellion was dealt with. And so Joshua had to deal with that. And he had to face his army that had never faced defeat. Consequently, we find a defeated Joshua. He offered a prayer during those days that was more akin to the prayer of a wimp than the prayer of a warrior. Just listen to it. Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Canaan, of the Jordan. It's not one of his finer days. This is new territory for our hero. He's been making field goals his entire life. When Moses called him and Caleb to cross over and spy out the promised land, he reported with courage. When he needed to stand beside Moses and serve as his right-hand man, he did for 40 years. When the time came for him to take on the mantle of Moses, he stepped forward. To step over the Jordan River, he led the people. To march around Jericho, Joshua did not flinch. But now, it's like the wind is knocked out of his sails. He's been brought face to face with one of Satan's greatest tools, and that is the tool of failure. He dragged himself back to his tent. The entire camp was somber. They buried 36 of their men. They witnessed the downfall of a countryman. And Joshua could sense the glares and the stares of the people. Oh, Joshua's not a good leader. He let us down. He doesn't have what it takes. He knew what they thought. Even worse, he knew what he thought. His mind sloshed with self-doubt. Maybe I'm not the right person for this job. I, could, I should have done better. It's all my fault. Joshua heard the voices, his own and theirs, and so did you. When you lost your job, when you flunked the exam, when you dropped out of school, when your marriage went south, when your business went broke, when you failed... The voices began to howl, didn't they? Like monkeys in a cage, they laughed, and you heard them. And you joined them. You upbraided yourself. You berated yourself. You disqualified yourself. You sentenced yourself to a life of hard labor in the leaven worth of poor self-worth. The voices of failure. You know, failure finds us all, doesn't it? Failure is so universal that we wonder why more self-help gurus don't write books about it. You can go to a bookstore and find a lot of books on how to succeed, but you'll look a long time before you find one that says how to fail. But we need to know how to fail because the truth of the matter is we all do. Maybe the self-help gurus don't write books on how to fail because they really don't know how to fail. How do you get through failure? But I want you to know that God has written a book on how to fail. The pages of the Bible are not stories of perfect lives, just the opposite. The pages of the Bible are stories of perfect messes. And yet the big and the good and the wondrous news of the Bible is God can use failures. 
And he used the failures of people then, and he uses the failures of people today. He used even the failures of Joshua to teach us what he says to us when we stumble, when we fumble, and when we miss a goal. If you'd like to fill in the blanks, here's number one. It's time to put the past in the past. God gave Joshua two stout reminders, one in chapter 7 and the other in chapter 8. In chapter 7, he told Joshua, get up. <laughs> That's kind of like that. Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? At some point, you just got to get up. And then in chapter 8, he said, do not be afraid or dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise and go up to I. God quickly and urgently called Joshua to get up. You see, failure is like quicksand. The longer you sit in it, the greater the odds that you'll get sucked under. You got to pull yourself up quickly. Sometimes it's very difficult, but God will help you do this. In God's hands, no defeat is a crushing defeat. In God's hands, no defeat is a crushing defeat. The scripture says, the steps of good men are directed by the Lord. He delights in each step they take. If they fall, if they fall, it isn't fatal. For the Lord holds them with his hand. Yes, you disobeyed. Yes, you stumbled. Yes, you fumbled. But though you failed, God's love does not. Face your failures by facing God's goodness. Face your failures by facing God's goodness. If you don't get this, you will miss your promised land. You will miss your glory days. You must believe that God's grace is great enough for your sins. You must. If you give in to the lie that says God cannot forgive me or God cannot use me, you might as well tie an anchor around your feet and jump in the ocean because you'll sink. You must believe that God's grace is great enough for your failures. You must. You must pitch your tent on promises like this one. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Everyone stumbles. Everyone does. The difference is that some people stumble into guilt and others stumble into the arms of God. Which are you? Those who find grace do so because, as Paul said, they walk according to the Spirit. That means they listen to the voice of God. They trust the Word of God. They believe the promises of God. As God told Joshua, arise. Do not be afraid or dismayed. Arise and go. The prodigal son did this. Remember the great story of the prodigal son, the most famous failure in the Bible, perhaps. He said, I will arise and go to my father. His story, just in case you've forgotten, he was the boy who received an inheritance, and he was the boy who wasted his inheritance on wild living. And his trail dead ended in a pig pen. Pig pen! Not a recommended career path for a young Jewish boy to be feeding the pigs. He got so hungry that one day the food in the pig trough began to smell like a sirloin steak. And he leaned over and he began to, ah, it smells good. Ah, that looks good. 
And he reached over and he took a napkin and he tied it around his neck. And he went to his backpack and he got a shaker of salt. And he put it out on the pig slop. And he pulled a fork out of his pocket. And he was just about to dig in for a bite. He could hear the <laughs> snorts of pigs around him. And he, he was just about to take a bite when something within him said, wait a second. Who are you? Who are you? And he pulled that napkin off and he threw the fork away and he threw the salt out. And then he said, I will arise. I will arise. I'll put my chest out. I'll put my head up. I'll put my shoulders back. I will arise and go to my Father. Now, friend, you can do that. You can. You can arise. Maybe you cannot disentangle all the knots that exist because of your failures. Maybe you can't undo all the bad decisions that you've made, but you can do this. You can stand up. Like the farmer said, there ain't no future in the past. You got to stand up and you got to press forward. That's what, that's what the prodigal son did. Life in the pig pen stinks, doesn't it? But staying there is just stupid. At some point, you got to stand up and say, okay, I've had enough of this. Even the Apostle Paul had to do this. He said, I leave the past behind. And with hands outstretched to whatever lies ahead, I go straight for the goal. No, you can't change your history, but you can always change your future. So put the past in the past. And here's number two, put God's plan in place. Put God's plan in place. God told Joshua to revisit the place of his failure. He said, Arise and go to Ai. See, I've given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. Basically, God told Joshua, Okay, we're going to try it again. This time, I'm going to tell you what to do. And Joshua did. He and his men made a midnight march from Gilgal. It's a journey of about 12 miles. He positioned this crack commando unit behind the village and then 5,000 men behind them. And then he went around to the front and he got the attention of the king of Ai. The king of Ai, still strutting from his recent victory, came in full attack on Joshua. Joshua turned and ran. The king of Ai pursued Joshua, leaving his village unprotected so the crack commando unit plus the 5,000 men attacked the village and destroyed it. Joshua, when he realized that their victory was complete, turned around, came at the king, and the king was caught between the two. The victory was complete, and it was swift. Now compare that particular initiative with the first one. The first time, Joshua only sent a few men. The second time, he sent a lot of men. The first time, Joshua only consulted his advisors. The second time, he consulted God. The first time, Joshua didn't even go. The second time, he led the pack and led the attack. Everything was different. He needed a new plan, and God gave him one. Maybe that's what you need. You know, failures are only fatal if we fail to learn from them. Right? Failures are only fatal if we fail to learn from them. Just see your failures as tuition payments <laughs> on your education. What can you learn from this failure? And if you learn something, then that failure is worth the effort. This was the message that Jesus gave to Peter. Remember the apostle Peter? In one particular time, Jesus was preaching on the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd was so thick it proved to be an occupational hazard. He needed a buffer between him and the people, so he stood in Peter's boat and he preached. After he preached, he turned to Peter and said, let's go fishing. Well, Peter didn't want to go fishing. He had fished all night and he hadn't caught anything. He didn't want to fail again. He didn't want to fail in front of all those people. Those people were all standing there on the shore watching. Besides, what does Jesus know about fishing? He's a carpenter. He's a preacher. But what does he know about fishing? 
But Jesus insisted, and finally Peter relented. Peter said, at your word, I will let down the net. In other words, I will trust what you say. Well, the catch was so significant that the boat nearly sank from all the fish that they caught. You see, sometimes we just need a new plan. We need to invite Jesus into our boat, invite him to show us the new way. The Bible says, in everything you do, put God first and look at this, <clears throat> and he will direct you. Hmm. He will help you. He will guide you. He will lead you. He will orient you. He will direct you, and then he will crown your efforts with success. Maybe all you need to do is try it again a second time. This time, invite Jesus to get into the boat. This time, invite Jesus to get into the marriage. This time, invite Jesus to get into the business. This time, invite Jesus to go to school with you. Invite Jesus, and he will help you. Abraham did this. Abraham failed the first time. The result was Ishmael. The second time he had faith, the result was Isaac. Moses needed 10 plagues. One of them wasn't enough. Two of them wasn't enough. He had to have 10 plagues plus a miracle at the Red Sea to get the children of Israel out of Egypt. Elijah, he was an emotional train wreck after Mount Carmel, but God didn't give up on him. Peter, Peter became an apostle. Judas became synonymous with betrayal. Why? They both committed the same sin. They both denied Christ, but Peter decided to trust the grace of Christ, and Judas could not bring himself to do so. Sometimes we just need to try again. We need to ask God for a fresh plan for new advice, for new counsel. When our mission team was in Brazil, my wife and I were in Rio de Janeiro from 1983 to 1988. From 1983 till about 1985, we had a tough uphill run. We felt like we couldn't get that church to grow. Most Sundays there were more gringos in the worship service than there were Brazilians. And we would sit and look at each other like, did we do anything? Are we making any progress? We got very discouraged. One of the fellow missionaries said, you know, we just need to get a new plan. And he suggested that we spend every Monday afternoon as a mission team praying, just reading the Bible and seeing if God would talk to us. So we did. And I can't remember why we selected the book of Galatians, but we all read through the book of Galatians together. And we were struck by the wonderful grace that the Apostle Paul taught. And I realized that as our preacher, I was teaching a limited grace. It was more legalism than it was grace, more what we have to do than what God has done. So I changed my message, began talking a lot about God's forgiveness and second chances. But did you know our little church began to grow? We baptized 50 people in the next 12 months, which is quite a few for a church of 60 people. All we needed was a new plan. We needed to come back to the drawing board. Try it again. And that's all you need. Try again. Invite Jesus to get into the boat. Invite Jesus to give you some strength. You spent enough time in the pig pen. Rise up. And don't waste your failures. Wise up. Learn from them. You were never made to drag around yesterday's failures, nor were you made to face tomorrow without help. Leave your regrets behind and try again, this time with Jesus in your boat. God has not forgotten you. Listen, God wants your story to have a happy ending. David said this about God. You, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. We always tell people, keep your head up. But sometimes we get so discouraged, we have to have God lift our head. And he will. He'll place the fingers of his loving hand right under our chin and lift us up. The Apostle Paul said, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You're going to be better because of this. You're going to be wiser because of this. You're going to know more about God's grace than you ever did before. Today's stumble is about to become 
tomorrow's victory parade. It did for Scott Norwood. Remember the kicker for the Buffalo Bills? Wide and to the right forever. He walked off the field that night with his head hanging down. He didn't say anything to anyone in the locker room. He couldn't sleep that night in the hotel. For the next two or three days, he just kept replaying and replaying that missed kick. A few days later, back in Buffalo, the city of Buffalo threw a big party for the Buffalo Bills football team, even though they had lost. Downtown, they had a big parade. 25 to 30,000 people turned out, and they had a large platform on which the players were standing and they were to be received. Well, Scott Norwood did not want to go, but he had to. He was on the team. So he went, and he went up on the platform, and he positioned himself back behind the biggest lineman so no one could see him. He was hoping to slip in and slip out without talking to anyone. But the crowd had other ideas. Midway through the speech of a civic leader, a chant emerged from the audience. We want Scott. We want Scott. Well, Scott got nervous. He didn't know what they wanted him for. <laughs> but the football player stepped out of the way and walked Scott right up to the podium, and the crowd kept chanting, We want Scott. We want Scott. At a certain point when he appeared, they all gave him a standing ovation. They wanted him to know that even though he had missed the goal, he was still a part of the community. Do you know there's a passage in the Bible in Hebrews chapter 12 that talks about a great cloud of witnesses that surround us. Saints who have already gone to heaven right now are watching us. Thousands upon thousands, hundreds and thousands, hundreds and thousands are joined with the angels. Some of them are famous like Moses and Joshua and Paul and Mary and Martha. Some of them are anonymous yet very important to you, your grandma, your uncle, your, your children, your parents, people who have gone before. They right now are experiencing heaven, God's glory and God's grace. And I would suggest to you that if you press your ear up against the curtain of heaven, you will hear them calling your name. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. God's not finished with you yet. Be strong. Hang in there. Keep serving. Pull yourself up. Rise up. Wise up. And move forward. You may have missed a goal, but you're still a part of God's family. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for these promises that you give us. Thank you that Joshua, when he was defeated, he didn't give up, but he tried again. Lord, we've all suffered defeats and we've all failed. But today, Lord, we, we receive your blessing, your promise to be with us and to keep us strong. We're going to press into this week with renewed con conviction, renewed hope, renewed vigor. We're going to be better because of this. And we're not going to let the devil win a victory. We're going to be strong, strong in your grace, strong in your presence. Thank you, Lord. We bless you now in Jesus' name. And all the church said,